Okay, Deputy Ryan. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, Mr McCarthy, uh, uh, um, you, there was indeed a, a strategic environmental assessment carried out on the National Planning Framework. I think we made a submission ourselves. Um, but why was it that there was no strategic environmental assessment done of the National Development Plan? Um, as I understand it, and Paul, you can, you can uh, correct me on this, as I understand it, uh, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform uh, formed the view that it wasn't required? Because it, it, it's, um, it's a, a, a financial or budgetary framework, um, they were satisfied that it did not require SEA um, under the, the European directives. Do you think the European institutions will accept that when they come to meet us and look at what's happening in our climate approach? That's, uh, I suppose, uh, that, that, the, the, as I said, the, the Department of Public Expenditure Reform are satisfied with that. They have, I think, they have legal advice to back that up. So, I, you know, that, that's a matter for for the uh, European institutions to determine themselves. In your, own, in your own strategic environmental report, you recognised that the nature of yours was strategic and broad objectives, therefore it wasn't a project level, which the National Planning Framework was. You get a completely different context if you go for a project level, which the National Development Plan is. Um, and I think the European institutions aren't going to accept it because the EPA, three months after the National Planning Framework was agreed, publicly acknowledged that they haven't the first faintest idea what the climate implica Im implications of it were. And I think any assessment they've since done, or that's coming out, is that it will see an increase in emissions rather than a reduction in emissions in key sectors. Transport and agriculture emissions are forecast to rise. And we're going into a European negotiation process where we have to cut them at least 30, 40 percent. And I think in that context, the European institutions are going to look to see we've got this whole process wrong again. We got it wrong in the early part of the last decade when our strategic planning framework was completely divorced from the National Development Plan at that time, and the exact same thing has happened again. Would you not agree there's a real divergence between the National Planning Framework and the National Development Plan in terms of our environmental results, our objectives? The one, the planning framework is, is in my mind, the right track. The National Planning Framework, the National Development Plan ignored it in the end. Do you want comments on that, Deputy? Yeah. If you want to comment on it, or if it's, it's uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't believe so, Deputy. I think there was a, there was a huge amount of uh, collaboration and engagement um, right across government as part of the process of doing the, both the NPF and the uh, and the National Development Plan. Obviously, when it comes to the rollout of individual uh, individual uh, projects under the National Development Plan. Um, uh, the, I suppose the, the proof will be in the will be in the pudding at uh, at that stage. But I mean, the NPF is very clearly, uh, uh, as you've as you've acknowledged, is very clearly in the space of urban compact uh, urban compact growth, where we can make better use of existing services, better use of public uh, public transport, and basically better use of uh, of land. And I think uh, from the engagement that we've had and the engagement across government uh, as part of the process of doing the two documents together, we think the NDP and the NPF are very closely aligned. Can I have an example why I don't agree with that? A couple of examples. First, it comes from this room. We had Transport Infrastructure Ireland doing to the Transport Committee, and they were asked what was their key transport objectives in terms of tackling gridlock in Dublin. And their answer was, we're going to widen the N11, we're going to widen the N7, we're going to widen the N6, we're going to widen the N4, widen the N3, widen the N2, all allowing for greater long-distance commuter traffic into Dublin, despite Dublin being gridlocked. How does that fit in with the, the National Planning Framework objectives of compact development? Um, well, I suppose the, the NPF's compact urban growth um, uh, thrust is dependent on uh, and will be realised through new housing development taking place in the areas that have been targeted for it. And the, the proportions, for example, that we, we aim to achieve within the, uh, within the M50, for example, in, uh, in Dublin. So if, if we can get that piece right, and we get that carried through to the spatial economic strategies and into the city and county development plans, then the housing development, if that takes place in the right, uh, in the right locations, in proximity to urban, uh, to urban centres where economic activity is happening, then that will, that think, will achieve... Do you think that's motorways going to help expansion and extension and the approach road to is going to help that? Do I think it's going to help the... Compact development of Dublin, the centre, the development of the right location? Well, I mean, the, the um, roads development programme is in, is in part, to, to my knowledge, is to address existing, existing congestion problems um, uh, in, in some respect, at least. But, I mean, 
whether, a, whether motorways are or aren't built, if we can get the residential development and the associated um, uh, services that are required to support it in place in the right locations, that is going to be a fundamental driver of what the NPF seeks to achieve. Do you think the National, Plan, the National Development Plan will achieve the emissions reductions that we know we have to achieve within the European Shared Responsibility for 2030 and indeed 2050? I think the, uh, you, that's probably a question that um, uh, I think our, our colleagues in, in Decay would be better placed to answer, but I think we're satisfied from the engagement that we have had as part of the process of preparing the NPF that the NDP is aligned to support what the NPF seeks to achieve in a way that it hasn't been before. Can I explain to you why I think that's utterly wrong? Um, we've heard the Minister for non-stop going on about he's cornered 23 billion of spending. 13 of it is existing investment by ESB Airgrid, which they happen every year on grid investment. That's, that would have happened anyway. And in the retrofit of buildings, which should be the most successful, the most carbon efficient reduction, the most first thing we do, there's a three billion figure for the next 10 years, I think, isn't it? What you said here today when you were asked a question, um, how much of that social housing retrofit you would do you said it would depend on the money. In other words, it's dependent on the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. How many of those 40,000 houses you cited at the cost, as Deputy Pringle discovered, of about a billion, if there were 30 grand, 25, 30 grand to deep retrofit each, how much would the, would the carbon saving from, that, from those 40,000 houses being retrofitted? I don't have that calculation with me. How come we're not, if we're going to face the European Commission in a couple of months' time, where we have a 50 million tonne at least shortfall, we do have those calculations, and that actually rather than going to finance our Department of Public Expenditure Reform begging for money, we're going saying, here's our project, 40,000 houses, we'll save X amount of carbon, this is the cheapest carbon saving that you can achieve to meet this agreed, treaty-based European institution signed off at every level, rather than going cap in hand, as we, are, we heard here today, to Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, please give us some money. Why don't we base this, or hope, if the National Development Plan was based around climate objectives, you'd know that figure. You would be in a much more powerful position with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. How come that level of engagement between the departments is not happening? Well, I think, um, I mean, the point that I was making in relation to how quickly the retrofitting exercise will be completed, it is ultimately down to um, uh, the, the level of financial resources that are made available. But that's not to say that in going looking for those resources, that of course we wouldn't marshal all of the, the, the positive impacts that would flow from uh, the retrofitting programme, not just in terms of carbon, uh, carbon emissions, but also in terms of health, uh, and this is a difficult area to try to quantify, but there are health and comfort benefits. How how much uh, that's of that three, three billion are you going to get? Well, I can't tell the I can't tell the future, but um, we will certainly be as we move on and finalise our arrangements for phase two. We will certainly be pressing strongly for as significant a programme of investment as we can possibly get in order to deliver the retrofitting programme as quickly as we possibly can. How did can. we sign off on a national development plan and put a three billion figure down, and we didn't know? where the money was going and what the carbon abatement or reduction would be from it. How come that wasn't done as part of the National Development Plan process? Within the, the three billion, um, obviously that is targeted towards retrofitting generally. We will, and public funding um, uh, is something that, for, for the public housing stock, that we will be looking to prioritise as part of the distribution of that, uh, of that uh, overall pot of money. But it is ultimately going to be, it is ultimately going to be a, as is always the case, it is ultimately going to be a, a, fight, for, uh, a fight for resources, marshalling the arguments that can be brought to bear in terms of what the resources will actually achieve in climate, in health and in other terms. We've just got the Department of PK's, um, sorry that's not it, we just got their submission, the public consultation paper on um, the writing of the National Energy and Climate Action Plan, which is the first draft has to be done by the end of the year. I'll have to be saying, first read, it's unintelligible, and I think God help any person, member of the public, trying to make a submission on it. But surely, as part of this process, you will have to have an answer to that question, and indeed it might not be, I don't think it'll be a three billion figure, I think it needs to be a multiple of that. 
because we're facing 600 million euro fines a year at least for the carbon gap we're facing. You surely in the retrofitting of public buildings, John Fitzgerald suggested it should be 5 billion spent on social housing alone. Our climate reputation increasing after the budget yesterday is in a state of tatters. Our government's outlook and management of it is really open to question now. Surely you'll have to answer to some, surely you're going to your colleagues by Christmas and saying, here's our contribution to the 50 million. If we did not, not 40,000 houses, if we did 100,000 houses, this is the amount of carbon we'd save, this is the amount of cost, this is the amount of fuel poverty we would reduce. Why aren't you doing that as part of this process? Well, I suppose we, I mean, we, we are doing uh, we are doing a lot as part of this uh, this process in terms of what we're doing in terms of building regulations. So that we're actually this is actually these are new performance requirements that we're going to be uh, we're going to be introducing that will apply across housing developments generally, and will apply across major major renovations. The key piece, uh, and this arose in the in the conversation earlier, is. In the case of um, the, the stock of, uh, of housing, we obviously have the public housing stock and we're moving, as I say, into phase two, where we're going to be looking to, at minimum, deal with those 40,000 oldest houses at a particular cost, as we understand at this point in time. But the key piece is going to be how the, um, the remaining resources are going to be deployed in order to bring the balance of the, of the, the private housing stock okay. into, into a better place. In, I, I, I'm afraid I'm with Mary Donnelly on the terms of um, continuous fossil fuel heating. I'm with her in terms of it makes sense to do it now. I heard the arguments from the department here today. We, we, we do it to keep supply of houses going and to bring competition. I don't think we need competition from gas and oil. I think we have to stop gas and oil now. But on a separate question, you, you write in your, in your speech about the part L, the um, costing of everything, the uh, cost optimal levels. What's the cost of carbon that you're working on in that or in any other of the work you're doing? Do you want to say you've got yeah. the... So um, we took, um, we, we have uh, done our cost optimal study. Um, we took our forecasts from the SEAI, SEAI uh, cost of carbon. Um, I think it's a 15 year forecast uh, that they gave us. Um, that starts off at around the 20 euro per kilo per, per tonne and increases uh, year on year. And then um, we also did a 2% uh, sensitivity on it. So as well as running it at the baseline uh, that SEAI, uh, uh, SEAI's forecast, we also increased it 2% year on year. So at the end of 30 years, there's a 60% increase on your, the SEAI figure. And what's your discount rate? Our discount rate, so we did um, a 3% discount rate. We did it from a societal and a financial perspective. So we did a 3% discount rate and a 5% discount rate from the societal perspective. And that's the perspective we use to set the building regulations. And we also did a 7% and a 10% discount rate from a financial uh, perspective to inform us, to inform the, the, the the analysis, but we decided that um, the 5% discount rate was the more appropriate discount rate to set our performance requirements on because we want to look at it from a societal perspective and that gives a better uh, benefit to future savings. And were they the same broad costs of carbon that were applied in the National Development Plan in terms of signing off on that? Um, so I'm not, I wasn't involved in the development of the National Development Plan, but these were the official forecasts from SEAI. Okay. And do you, in the part of the regulations, you're saying your cost, look at the co capital cost up front and the fuel cost, or the running costs, do you include the cost of carbon in all the calculations? In so from a societal perspective, we do include the cost of carbon, and from a financial perspective, we don't include the cost of carbon. But we used the societal perspective to set our performance requirements. Okay. Um, I have one other question, if I can, so I uh, can encourage it, just, or, uh, just to get my, my head around it. Um, do you accept, I'm being critical here, and since I'm asking teasing questions, because there are teasing questions to be asked, do you accept my analysis, my assessment of all the modelling that shows we're 100 million tonnes short between, for the next decade in our carbon um, emissions, and that we will have to make up that gap? I think, I, for in terms of uh, in terms of gap, um, deputy, I would rely on the, the EPA do an annual uh, an annual profile in relation to uh, in relation to that. I don't know whether the figures that you're you're quoting relate uh, exactly to that, but I mean they do go through a very uh, a very 
uh, precise uh, annual exercise, so um, I think the, the figures in terms of the gap are, are clearly identified in that. And, and so how is it that the public service is not engaged in a process? You're not coming forward. I've had three Secretary Generals here now, and not one of you have actually seemed to be engaged in the process of closing that gap in recognising that our national development plan isn't good enough, that our national mitigation plan won't do it, that the scale of ambition is a multiple of what we need to be doing. Why is it that I've had three sector, we've had three sector generals here now who have refused to recognise that reality? Um, well, I think in terms of closing the, uh, closing the gap, uh, obviously our further move towards INZEB is uh, an important piece in terms of closing the, uh, closing the gap. Our, um, intention to move on to a phase two of retrofitting of the social housing stock is an important step in closing the uh, closing the gap and we are working with as part of the process that I think the uh, Department of, uh, of Climate Action mentioned to you about the process that they are engaging in to look at basically what are the range of options that government is going to have to uh, choose from in order to ensure that the gap is actually bridged. Just last question. If I what were you given in the budget yesterday for the next phase of the social housing retrofit, deep retrofits? I think are we, is it 25 million we're working for, for next 20, year? 25 million? Yeah. Now we don't know because you don't know, you couldn't give me the figure of what the actual emission savings would be, but I'm fairly sure if we go on that trajectory to meeting the 2030 target, and when I know what's happening, there's not a single public transport being built this year or next year. Um, our transport emissions are rising 4% per annum, our agricultural emissions are rising, it's rather rising everywhere. Improving the NZ building standards is not going to deliver the scale of emissions reduction that would see your department contributing to getting this country out of a hole, which is the 600 million euro fines we're facing, and Europe's not going to let us off this, on this one. 25 million is not enough. If it, if it had been 250 million, you'd say, okay, we're on track. Would you not accept that, that we, we have to be looking at a tenfold increase in ambition if we're going to be serious about closing that gap? Absolutely. I think we've, as I mentioned earlier, we're migrating from phase one, which was a much lower cost um, uh, programme, into phase two, where I think I've acknowledged very clearly the costs are going, to be, are going to be more. So I would expect, according as our capital ceiling increases in the years after 2019, that you will see that figure uh, rising so that we can accelerate the, the momentum in the, in the phase two programme. Um, apart from phase two and apart from INZEB, um, obviously the, the national planning framework is designed at a very high level to actually be the strategic driver to underpin a lot of the progress that yes we will have to rely on other departments to actually deliver on but if we didn't have that as a strategic planning framework um, I think our challenge in terms of climate change would be, would be significantly greater. The last point, if I can, uh, Kirill, because just the reason I'm interested in that figure, I, I, what I've been trying to get in advance of these commission meetings is for departments to come in advance and say, here is our additional projects that would help close the gap. And then we debate those and think, which are the better ones? So we can compare, contrast, which is the most economic, which is the best social benefits, and so on. None of the departments have done that yet. The next one, whoever Secretary General is next up, needs to come in saying, given we're in this process with the European National Energy and Climate Action Plan, given we're short and given we have to have additional measures, here's what they are. If you could, in writing, just following up to this commission, present analysis in written form as to what the emissions reductions would be from a much bigger, or from the current planned, but even a scaled up retrofit of deep scale of deep buildings and a rough cost abatement curve in terms of what's going to cost us, benefit us, and, or what's going to cost. I bet you it's going to be the winning project. I bet you you'd scoop the pot. So your department should be doing it as a, because you're going to be a better, pro but it should be carbon led, not just for Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. And the last point, just the reason why I was very keen on that memo from the joint, the forum you have with Department of Deeper and other departments on the implementation of the National Development Plan, is Mary Donnelly from the European Commission recommended that there be some sort of monthly meeting of top senior civil servants on this climate, climate issue and that they would report to government every month, quarterly reports, much more significant reports. It seems to me we have close to that structure in place with this forum that you have. 
but it needs to realise that the national planning framework needs to completely change, the national development plan rather, needs to completely change and really implement what was set out as, a, as an objective of the national planning framework, which the current national planning, na national development plan does not do. Turn that forum into a national development plan forum, into a national climate forum where senior civil servants, because this is the big, big game for the public service. If you do not achieve this, this, this turnaround in our whole approach, I think Europe will roast you. Thank you.